of John, chapter 14, verses 1 through 12. Listen now to these words from our Lord. Don't be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. My Father's house has room to spare. If that weren't the case, would I have told you that I am going to prepare a place for you? When I go to prepare a place for you, I will return and take you to be with me so that where I am, you will be too. You know the way to the place that I am going. Thomas asked, Lord, we don't know where you are going. How can we know the way? And Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through my way. If you have really known me, you will also know the Father. From now on, you know him and have seen him. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father. That will be enough for us. And Jesus replied, don't you know me, Philip, even after I have been with you all this time? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am the Father and the Father is in me? The words I have spoken to you, I don't speak on my own. The Father who dwells in me does his works. Trust me when I say that I am the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe on account of the works themselves. I assure you that whoever believes in me will do the works that I do. They will do even greater works than these because I am going to the Father. The words of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Most holy God, sometimes to begin again, we have to start with a vision of the end. You give us a vision of peace, a vision where all are gathered, all are welcomed, where swords are smashed into plowshares, where famine no longer exists, where diseases are cured, and where the end of life is peaceful and full of dignity and even hope. Most holy God, help us work with you to journey to complete this vision. May we be your hands and your feet and your co-creators in building heaven on earth. In Christ's name, amen. So I was getting gas at the gas station later at night than usual. I was filling up so I wouldn't have to stop the next morning when there was a big trip out of town for an appointment. And then that way I could just go hit the road. So I fill up with gas, and then I go into the gas station to get cookies. Because cookies. And behind the counter is an oddly awkward kind of fellow that works the late shift. I see him there quite a bit if I'm in there late. He's a nice enough guy. He is kindly indifferent to the customers. He doesn't make much small talk, but he smiles appropriately at you. He makes you at least feel seen. He looks you in the eye when he takes your money or tells you how to insert the card or not insert the card or which button to press next. I appreciate that about a person when they look you in the eye and they acknowledge you. So I show my deferential indifference back and I, I believe he feels the mutual appreciation of the acknowledgement of a hard day. You know the kind of person I'm talking about, right? They don't just work at gas stations. Uh, they, they work in hospitals. They, they work in clinics. They work in restaurants. They work in schools. They, they work in office buildings, insurance companies. 
Those people you recognize, your acquaintances, but you're not acquainted. So fast forward one day, and I decide to chatter. I love to chatter. It is a gift. So I asked the guy with a what's up nod of the head, and if you didn't know, this (laughs) means... I know you, right? I've seen you enough. I recognize you. This means I have no idea who you are and we're not going to (laughs) talk. And I figured this this guy knew uh, internally, whether consciously or not, that this meant what's up. And so I give him the what's up and I said, you watching any good shows? Because he looks like the type of guy that may be streaming some good shows that I may be interested in. And he nods back suspiciously, which made me assume, which I'd hoped, that he would be a sci-fi guy. And, and, and perhaps the type of sci-fi guy who would say something like, well, Star Trek and Marvel comics are too commercial for me, while pushing up his bifocal glasses. So I thought, I thought he would know of some off-beaten path shows worth streaming. And what I loved about this little chatterbox conversation was when I asked him, are you watching any good shows? He pondered it. He really pondered it. This, This indifferent guy, typically, and he ponders my question. He gives it serious thought, and he says, mash. And I said, oh my gosh, I used to love that show. Do you remember that theme song? How did, how did that theme song go? Yeah, Ming. <laughs> That's what we're starting with. It was such a good show. And you remember, I mean, they, they really, really pushed boundaries on that show. They pushed the boundaries of medical ethics. They pushed the boundaries of morals. They pushed the boundaries of where we are as a nation. It was social commentary to its best. And I thought, I thought that maybe this clerk and I would be customer friends. You know, where we could banter when I would go in. But I don't remember seeing a name tag. I don't even know this guy's name. And I've probably talked to him at least, at least 20 times, if not more than that, or just buying cookies. (laughs) And so I said, what else are you watching? And he said, Andy Griffith. I, uh, <laughs> and I said, oh. And, and then he added, I, I don't have cable or internet. So uh, I just have those old digital bunny ears where you can get the free TV, and it doesn't come in very good. Uh, so I just kind of get whatever I can watch. Uh, and, and so I, I don't get to watch a whole lot of new stuff, um, but I, I, do, I do like to watch my old movies. I have a lot of movies. Oh, and Big Bang Theory. Uh, that show was so cute. So cute. Now, I don't know how much this guy makes an hour, but I am pretty sure he puts in 40-plus hours a week And I'm not trying to be judgmental, and and I surely don't know him enough to make such an assumption. But in my heart, I am pretty sure that this guy is single, close to 40, um, and uh, uh, physically a little out of shape. Uh, Not obese, but uh, he probably wasn't ever much of an athlete you know what I mean. You, you, can, 
kind of deduce that uh, he had been bullied perhaps a few times in his life and that most likely he had a younger sibling or someone, a neighbor or someone like that, a little bit smaller than him, who after he was bullied, he would go and bully them. And you could tell this by his guarded mannerisms. He's the type of, of, of person who might flinch a little too quickly if you made a sudden movement, which I appreciate because I had uh, four sisters in my house growing up and two other stepsisters, and if you make a sudden move, I flinch. I imagine that he didn't go to high school prom like many of our kids went to this weekend, that one of our members DJed at this weekend. Can you imagine making a DJ list for high school kids today? I bet they don't even know the MASH theme song. <laughs> and I, I bet that there was a conversation in his house about, about the high school prom and, and why he shouldn't go. Probably his mom calling it a dumb tradition sharing how it just makes rush work for everybody who does all the tailoring of those expensive dresses and that the only people who are happy about it are the owners of the tailor shop and the kids going on a big time date to the prom. And you know most of the parents aren't real happy. Or maybe they are. Maybe they are if they have some good memories. But I could imagine this guy's mom saying, you don't need to go to prom. No one will go with you. You don't have a date, and it's just a waste of money. So I went and did a little research, just guesstimating. I assume, I assume that our friend would possibly take home $15 an hour. And I did a little math, and that would be about $28,938 after taxes, annually, at 40 hours a week. So I looked up where that ranked in the state of Iowa, and I found out that 14,580 is the poverty line for a single household. It's just above 29000 for a family of four. Which means, according to federal and state standards, our friend is doing pretty good. He is a whopping 200% above the federal poverty line. With no cable or internet and a pretty beat-up used car. And I, honestly, I don't... I don't want to sound, well, I think, I think we, we can all be a pretty good judge of character sometimes, just by the way somebody walks and talks. Do you know what I mean? And I don't think that this guy has a whole lot of upward mobility in life. And in fact, I think he's pretty darn comfortable where he's at. He seems pretty disgruntledly content with where he is in his life situation, like he's accepted where he's at. And I don't think that he's going to improve his financial situation drastically over the next 40 years of his life unless it involves selling baseball cards or action figures on eBay, which I imagine he has a nice collection of. So let's look at how this compares. Poverty is defined in the Encyclopedia Britannica as the state of one who lacks a usual or socially acceptable amount of money or material possessions. Poverty, the state of one who lacks a usual or socially acceptable amount of money or material possessions. Well, that definition would qualify just about all of us as being in a state of poverty, because I don't feel like I have a socially acceptable amount of money or <laughs> material possessions. That's not true. I, I feel abundantly blessed, but it's all relative, right? 
Isn't that definition a good way of people in power defining who isn't in power and who is in poverty? It doesn't take into, into account the many other forms of poverty that there are emotional poverty, relational poverty, physical poverty. But it does. It does good as a definition because it's vague, and it's vague enough to represent the spectrum of poverty, especially when the people who aren't in poverty get to decide on what is a sociably acceptable amount of money, that we get to decide what is a good quality of life for someone, and that we get to judge and standards or living of living are set by those who have. So I went down the rabbit hole on our state government website. And I found that the per capita income for each individual household, including all non-working adults in the household, is $34,817. That's the per capita income. Now, if you multiply this by the number of people in the workforce in Iowa, at 1,352,000 roughly, if you multiply that, those two numbers together, you get a payroll in Iowa of $47 million roughly. That's what businesses across the state pay to their employees. If you go down the rabbit hole a little bit farther, you find some other interesting tidbits of information. The total retail sales, retail sales, so we're talking jackets, shoes, electronics, uh, consumer goods, right? Total retail sales. $50 million. Annual salary, $47 million. Retail, 50 Total health care receipts per household, sadly only $7 million. But when you have only 34000 a year coming in per household, you wouldn't expect that to be much. Adding those two things together, health care and retail sales, it shows that our working families are about $10 million in debt for consumer goods and health care. Now, don't trust me. I'm not a doctor. I'm not an economist. I only have a master's degree in theology. If I left the church, I could probably get a job at a gas station too. So I'm thinking this guy doesn't have cable or internet because they aren't a priority for him. Like other things, food and gas. I, I'm assuming that if we sat down to analyze his financial expenses, that we would find his biggest spending habit is having a place to live. It's like my grandpa used to say, that old quote, I'm so poor I can't afford to pay attention. So I wanted to ask him to come to church because we were chattering. We were chattering, and I love to chatter, and I love to invite people to come to church. But I hesitated because I wasn't sure. I wasn't sure that we fit him. Does that make sense? 
Now, I know that, that we would be welcoming. You would go over the top and you would, you would greet him and love him and, and do all those things. But I didn't, I didn't know. Uh, I, I just didn't know if he would want to come to church on Sunday morning after working the late shift when he can stay home and watch reruns of Andy Griffith and Big Bang Theory and MASH. Is what we're doing here on Sunday morning a life-giving enough for him to say, yeah, I want to be there on Sunday morning. This is so much better than a friend's rerun. And, and I, I also hesitated because I thought this guy could see through anything that wasn't authentic and genuine. It's almost like because he reads those comic books, I, I, I'm assuming he does, I'm being judgmental, but I, I, that, that he, he has some type of x-ray vision that he can size up someone who is making an inauthentic offer and in the drop of a hat. Like he's just got that type of radar and suspicion uh, in his DNA because of how he has lived in his life. So I hesitated. And then I thought, and I struggled, and I, I thought, do I believe enough in what we are doing here for him to believe me when I invite him to come and be a part of it? Do I believe? Do I believe in what I do on a daily basis enough to want other people to be a part of it. Because if I don't believe it, if I don't believe, when I invite someone, that fish isn't going to bite. Say what you will about fish, but they're pretty smart. And if we're fishing for people, they're, they're smarter than fish. And so if... I'm not putting something good out there to lure their men. Then my net will come up empty again and again. You really have to believe in the mission and the vision. And it has to be something that is inside of you. It's not something that I can tell you. It's not something that someone else can do it's not something that another committee can be doing. It's got to be something inside of you. Ray Jones from the PCUSA Office of Evangelism says, Evangelism says, this is one of the first and most important steps in being a Matthew 25 congregation. Believing. Not believing in our confessional standards, not believing in supernatural beliefs, not believing in uh, resurrection or Easter or the Apostles' Creed, but believing in the way of Jesus. Believing that what we do makes a difference. Believing that what happens here shapes our lives and shapes the lives of people in our community. He says it's easy to share about things that we love, things that are inside of us, things that we innately believe in. He says, for example, my dog. He says, I can share with anyone about my dog who is laying right there because I love my dog. Or my kids. He says, I can share about my kids because they are a part of me. They are inside of me. And I get excited about sharing what my kids are doing. That story. It's easy to tell. And that's the thing. If you're going to pass the sniff test of authenticity... It has to be something that is genuine, that is passionate. 
It has to be a story that is inside of you. So I hesitated. And I thought, well, maybe, maybe this would be a good idea. I overheard some of you talking about the Big Bang Theory. This had to be months ago. It was at one of those little table conversations when you didn't know I was walking by and you were having one of those normal conversations. You know, the real, real talk happens in the parking lot, uh, but this was inside where it was safe. And, and I walked by and I heard someone say Big Bang Theory. My er- ears perked up and everyone said, that's cute. And I thought, I have an idea. Let's have a Big Bang party for this guy. I'm going to go invite him to church. We're going to pull down the big screen, and we're going to watch some reruns of the Big Bang Theory. And we're going to invite this guy, just this guy, for a Big Bang watch party. And we're going to go over the top and have a huge party with Big Bang stuff. And we're going to bring uh, action figures and trading cards, and, and we're really going to do it right. And we're going to have some fun, because I have a feeling that this guy isn't getting invited to a lot of parties. So let's have a party. Let's go over the top for this one person who, who I, I, I am judgmentally assuming does not have a place where he is 100% connected in community. And let's invite him in. Because our scripture says in God's house, there is much, much space. There are many rooms. And Jesus says, I'm going to prepare a place just for you. So let's prepare a place for this guy. Wouldn't that be fun? Wouldn't that be fun? If we could have a nerd fest and just invite every nerd we know, I would be the first in line. This is my tribe. These are my people. MASH, come on. Andy Griffith, you know there's a series called The Gospel According to Andy Griffith? There really is. What if we made a series, uh, the, the Gospel According to Big Bang Theory, and just had a good time with it? Can you imagine someone with little upward economic mobility thriving from doing good for other people? Haven't you seen those people? There was a girl from Ukraine who gave a speech at Iowa Wesleyan at our Kiwanis luncheon. Her building, her boyfriend's building across the street had been bombed. And she was in the basement with the medical care team providing assistance to other families. She spent her days with her family in a basement, hiding from bombs. And yet, in the midst of that, in in that war type of poverty, she was doing for others and living vibrantly. That's, That's what happens when you come into community. Can you imagine someone who feels like life can only go up this far realizing that they are actually able to go way up here, and it's not dependent on money or possessions. It's dependent on giving from their heart. And how transformative that would be. How over the top would you go to save one life? And this is literally about saving lives because people who belong to community, to churches, to organizations, have a longer lifespan, are less clinically depressed, and are less likely to commit suicide. I didn't know the name of the MASH theme song. Suicide is painless.
That is how important what we do is. Inviting people in, the uninvited, the ones we judge, the ones I judge, and saying, I'm no better than any of you. I just want you to be well, to belong, to be loved, and to love others. And Jesus says, when you do those things, you see me. You see the Father. And you will do even greater things than this. May it be so. In Christ's name, amen.